Hello, you delicious people, and welcome to another episode of Intimate Conversations with a friend that I have connected with, and then you know how the DNA spiral of life goes away, and then it comes back, but it's always up higher. So I'm so pleased today to have Ian Ferguson with us on Intimate Conversations. I think last time we were together was in the hot tub with my son, who was It five. was. Yeah, when was five. <laughs> yeah, five. When he was five, he's now 18. So that was oh the long the the DNA part. Yeah, really. He's six, five. What? He's 18. Whoa. I know. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> How old was my son? Because my son's only 12. Like what he like three. They were little, they were little guys. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. Jeez. So maybe Gabe was maybe seven. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, wow. but yeah, I just remember him not wanting to get out of the hot tub because he was really enjoying all the breasts in the, <laughs> <laughs> He was underwater swimming, saying, Mom, uh -huh. this is a fun, a fun life. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, it's so I'm going to read um, Ian's bio, everybody. But what's really beautiful is that um, Jaya uh, and a dear friend, always in, empowering me as a, as a friend, as a colleague, um, and as a mother, as we allow sexuality to be sacred and beautiful for our children and raising them in this beautiful um, honoring environment. So we'll, we'll get deeper into all of the ways that Jaya and Ian empower people with their sexuality. Um, so Ian is a master trainer of the Erotic Blueprint methodology and co-founder with Jaya Inc., a company dedicated to radically transforming how society discusses and experiences sex. And he's an international speaker who has appeared on top podcast for Tony Robbins um, and such media as GMA, Good Morning America, VH1, Anderson Live, and has been profiled in Details Magazine. And his mission, along with over a hundred certified erotic blueprint coaches, a hundred. It's more than that. It's actually, we trained 330 and now we have probably 220 active coaches. Wow. We need to wow. update that bio. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Matt Helm, who um, oh. I know I introduced you guys to uh, Sachin and then mm -hmm. how that's blown up and, and so many more people are um, certified. But yeah, I just had Matt on the show the other day and he's certified as an erotic blueprint. Awesome. Well, yeah. Very cool. um, so um, Ian, your mission is to release shame around sex, help people empower themselves to reclaim the pleasure and true erotic expression. That is their birthright. Hail, hail. Uh -huh. um, and this, this gentleman, Ian, he's a Renaissance man, a lifelong student of human potential. And um, way back when he was little, like this, I didn't know about you, the tap dance king of Ohio. Yes, of Northeastern Ohio. Let's be very specific about that. I don't think I necessarily dominated the state. Okay. But Northeast Ohio, I took it. Oh my God. Cause I grew up like jazz, ballet, tap oh, dance yeah. as well as a little girl. Mm -hmm. So we might have to, next time we get together, we might have to do, do a little dance. We'll, we'll hoof it out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and also performing in off Broadway theater in New York. Amazing. And then building a seven figure design business, serving celebrity clients like Drew Barrymore, Ashton Kutcher and Michelle Pfeiffer. Holy Toledo dude. Um, this is amazing. And then co-founding Jaya Inc., an international company, um, as we said, uplifting sexuality as something to be openly and honestly discussed, celebrated, and enjoyed. Um, and he's been driven by his desire to create a world with freedom of expression for all, a world where people are more connected to the truth of their bodies and to each other through authentic, honest communication and love. Um, yes, and back in 2007, which feels like it could be a, um, the, the hot tub time-ish, um, Ian partnered with Jaya, uh, an internationally recognized award-winning sexologist and best-selling author to co-found Jaya Inc., spreading the word about Jaya's revolutionary framework, the erotic blueprint breakthrough, which we're going to give you a link to so that you can um, discover your erotic blueprint, um, designed to radically transform how we talk about and experience sex. And so Let's go back to the hot tub days, maybe like uh, 15 years ago. Like, how did you even meet Jaya, Ian? So first off, mm. welcome, welcome. So good to be with you. So, Thank you. So inspired. And we'll get into this in a minute. The show on Netflix, Sex, Love, and Goop. Um, but how did you even meet Jaya? Well, I was part of a Five Rhythms ecstatic dance community. Fumbling Jaya, Towards Ecstasy? Was that? Um, yes. Yes. Fumbling Towards Ecstasy with Joe and... Um, uh, I'm forgetting the names. Um, yes, back in LA, yeah. Yeah, back in LA. 
And Jaya showed up, this person, this sort of magical creature showed up. Yep. The first time I really took notice of her, there was like 150 people in the room swirling around, swirling around, and Jaya is kind of standing in the middle of that room, stock still, her eyes open, and she had this sort of thing of like, she, her eyes were open so she could look out, but she had this inward gaze. So there's like this stillness in the middle of all of the chaos. And I was like, yeah. hmm, who's that creature? Yeah. And I didn't approach her that day, but during one of the evening dance sessions, I'm a contact improv person as well. Mm. And I wouldn't approach it the same way these days because my awareness around consent and boundaries and all that sort of thing is much more heightened. Yes. But I scooped in, she was kind of again in this stillness pose in the middle of a lot of activity. And I scooped in behind her and her arms rested on my arms and she sort of fell into my body. Wow. And then I took her on a whirlwind ride of spinning her around and all over the place. She talks about that as the first moment in her life where she's ever surrendered to a man. Whoa. So there was something magical in the moment. Yeah. And that was, it was so silently in movement on a dance floor is our first connection. Wow, wow. Um, and then how did it, so when I first met you, you guys were living in Topanga. Yeah. Um, how did the next phase of your relationship uh, unfold from that first magical surrender mm. dance? Well, it was all amazing, hot and heavy. So there's a lot of things that were kind of coming together at that time. I'd been married, I got divorced, and I'd gone through a couple of um, so, you know, monogamous, short-term monogamous relationships after my marriage. And I just kept feeling this thing of like, I'm, I feel like I'm boxing myself in here. I'm doing the same things that I was doing before, which is twisting myself in pretzels to become the person I thought the person Maybe. wanted me to be. Yeah. Except this time, I wasn't doing it as unconsciously. I was very aware that there were actual desires for the, the my partners to want me to be different or do you know do things differently, mm -hmm. and not really be my fully self-expressed person. Yeah. And it had become very clear to me that one of the things, the primary objectives of a relationship for me at least is I need to be in a relationship where I get to be seen hundred percent for who I am. I, yeah. I need to be authentic, truthful, and I need to be, have the capacity myself mm -hmm. to be with whomever it is that I say I love because love is not about control. Love is not about me um, needing them to be something else for me. Yeah, but finding a place where we can each be fully ourselves and seen yeah. and heard, even if that in certain circumstances or many circumstances runs contrary to my ease, like nervous system, like they, mm -hmm. you know, Jaya has things, people she's attracted to, things she likes to do. It's challenging for me, vice mm -hmm. versa. Mm -hmm. I have the same for her. Mm -hmm. But I, I was at a place of 100% authentic relating. I heard about this thing called polyamory from a friend of mine. Bunch of, bunch of people, I didn't know any of them. They were practicing up in San Francisco in that mm -hmm. relationship style. And knowing no one, knowing very, very little, except for it was about um, many loves and the idea that you can love more than one person. I was like, that. I don't know how that works, but that mm -hmm. sounds like that's the thing for me. Mm -hmm. So I made a personal declaration of I'm going to become Polly. I am going to tell everybody I'm interested in that that is what I'm doing. I'm seeing multiple people. And I thought, well, that's the end of my dating life. Everybody is going to run from me because I'm the pariah, the the you know the typical Venice uh, puer Turnus who you know can't handle intimacy and he's just playing the field. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'd be like alone in a bachelor, but I was very committed to this thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I'm not. I, I don't know what exactly what it is, but I'm going to do it. Yeah. And um, I it was very bizarre because I approached every person that I was attracted to with total forthrightness. Yes. And yes. within a couple of weeks, I was dating five women who all knew about each other. Wow. And they were not poly. They weren't, you know, didn't have skill sets in it. They were curious. And I think my author, my, you know, just being straight with them yeah. made them even more curious. Um, but in that time, about two weeks into that, I met Jaya. That's when the dance floor, um, yeah. The incident happened, the dance floor incident. <laughs> <That's> the, <laughs> um, and she had been living open relationship poly for about 10 years. So was the, she was the first person in the mix where I was like, oh, here's a here's like a kismetic moment of like, wow, I just declared this thing and now somebody's popped into my life. 
who unfortunately she had to be a little bit in the position of educator yeah. of like, how do you navigate this? And yes, you know, yes. some rocky tur- rocky stuff in that first couple of nine months. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was hot, heavy, passionate, amazing. And so passionate that nine months in, she's pregnant with our son. Mm-hmm. So um, then that turned into a whole other level of relationship yeah. and a different plan. Yeah. And the birth of our son coincided with what was the 2008, 2009 economic collapse. Yes. So my design business took a tank. I had a house in Venice. We were leasing something in Topanga for Eamon's birth. Yeah. I was spread way too thin. And when he was born, all of the magic and all of the ease and all of the passion and everything really took a turn. You know, Got like it. we were stressed out, tense, yeah. things that were not going well, all the skill sets that Jaya knew and about sex and sexuality, they weren't working. Like, you know, mm-hmm. she, you know, it was, it was, she was not getting her needs met. She yeah. didn't know how to inspire me to meet her needs. Yeah. My libido had tanked. My confidence had tanked. Yeah. I felt like I was running into the same patterns that I'd run into in previous relationships of not, of not being enough. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that went on for a decent period of time and was headed towards the, you know, ending our relationship. Wow. And that's also the time when the blueprints started to emerge in her practice. Yep, and we started yep. to actively create practices and um, games and ways to reinvigorate our connection through the erotic blueprint types and the erotic blueprint framework yeah. and really put it to practice. Because what we realized was Jaya was approaching me as a sexual because she's high sexual energetic. Yes. Yes. And I'm a was high, it wasn't quite out as much as it is now, but I was, you know, high sensual for sure. And I had high kinky. Yeah. So there's five types and we were, had two opposing of each, like yeah. highly ranked in either one. So we were, we were completely missing each other in mm. our eroticism Yes. and all of the other stuff, the hormonal cascade, Jaya's pelvic floor tear, all of these things were adding up to the perfect soup mm. of a relationship that so many people I know suffer when they have kids or they're, you know, getting mm. two or three, three years into the relationship, even though they don't have kids where the passion fades and they just don't know what to do. So yeah. as was kind of par for the course, Jai and I's relationship is we're, it's a Petri dish. You know, we're constantly experimenting with what can make this better, what can make it more engaging, more fun, more easy, more loving. Yeah. And uh, that's what, well, the erotic movement breakthrough and all that stuff was birthed out of it was really putting this stuff to practice within the cl- within our client base and directly within our relationship. Wow. I remember going over a couple times to your place, um, shooting some different interviews with her. And um, I remember her telling me about the assignment to write the book about kink mm-hmm. and discovering that it really woke you up. If I'm, mm-hmm. if I'm articulating that correctly and created a new way to be together and also, and then it was another, I don't know, it could have been another five years since I talked to her next, um, another layer of trauma to shift from her being sexual first to that actually being somehow mm, tendrilled with, with trauma and how she's unfolded since. When did the, when did the blueprints happen in the, the timeline of, of discovering kink for you and, uh, and how did that, how did you wake up? How did the blueprints wake up? How did the relationship wake up? What is the timeline and discovering, oh my God, this is who I am. Mm-hmm. So it was somewhere around 2012, 13, where things started to dial in for Jaya. It was one particular client session that uh, she had where you know, they were trying all the things with one of the clients, her having his uh, wife or partner try sexual activities and stimulation and all that kind yes. of stuff. Yeah. And it was nothing. It was just like a dead zone. Yeah. And Jai was like, okay, well, let me try something here. And she started to do some of the energetic of like floating and distance and tease and not touching his body. And it just instantly lit him up. He started having the Kriya responses and the quaking and his breath changed. And he's yeah. like, what is happening to me? Because he had been masking as a sexual, like putting on that mask of the, the male sure. kind of guy. I'm supposed to like sex. I'm supposed to get erect. I'm supposed to have all this stuff right. in, in, in the stereotypical version of eroticism. Yeah. And this thing just lit him up 
And that was, I think, the biggest fulcrum moment of all of a sudden Jaya having, you know, her 15 years of experience at that point, all of a sudden go, holy crap. I'm actually, yeah. with, I've been witnessing these patterns for years. Yes. And then it started to dial in and related to the kinky, the blueprints first were energetic, sensual, um, energetic, sensual, sexual, uh, sexual and shapeshifter. Ah, ah, so Kink wasn't even in it in the beginning. Kink wasn't even in ah, there. Curious. Okay. And so because that Because one that of the man- things with the energetic is the energetic, one of the shadows of the energetic is the energetic type can have a judgment about other forms of erotic play. So they can mm. think that sexual is base and animalistic and it's mm. not higher sexuality and spiritual sexuality and, it, and, and, and therefore dismiss it. Mm. So kink for Jaya up to that point was something must be wrong with people that they want to you know, engage in pain or these games of you know, dominant su- submission, spanking, yeah. all that sort of thing. There must be something going on there. Right. So it was sort of, it was just kind of like shoved off into the corner, wasn't part of the deal. She says she didn't know that we didn't know that I was kinky from the very beginning. All you had to do was look at my small collection of toys when we met. <laughs> You'd have a pretty, pretty clear clue. Pretty clear understanding. Yeah. yeah, but it was not, it was not nearly as expressed and it definitely had the, the shadow of my kink was shame because my, uh, right? So the, yes. the, the fantasies, the things that I want to play out, yes, they're out of the norm culturally. They're, they're edgy. Yes, yes. Um, yes. So holding those in reserve, leaving them in the recesses of my mind, it was in two, when Fifty Shades of Grey was... Yeah the book and then headed towards the theaters and her publisher said, we want you to write a book on kink. Yeah. And Jaya was like, I don't know anything about kink. So if they want me to write a book on kink, I've got to go into deep immersive study of this topic. Yes. So we took on a, just like I said, the Petri dish, like, okay, well, I didn't, and, and, and well, that's a whole other story, but um, the, the experimentation, cause we, we kind of figured, okay, well, I got some kink going on. We just didn't know sort of how deep it was. Yeah. She's like, okay, well, let's, what about this? We take on a 40, 40 experiment yep. where yep. for 40 days, I will dominate you and you'll, sub, you'll be my submissive. We'll take a 10 day break and then we'll flip it and you'll dominate me and I'll, I'll be your submissive. And throughout the entire process, we'll be getting coached by kink experts, uh, taking us really deep into all of the practices from the psychological kink to the physiological kink and what it is to really own and hold that space as a dominant Mm. and what it is to surrender. Mm. So we did it. I wouldn't recommend this for the light hearted. I wouldn't say go in with a 40, 40. It's very intense. We were doing three hour scenes, six hour scenes. We had a couple of sections, sections of our experiment where we were 24 seven dub sub dom uh, experimentation and it was extraordinary, but it was, whoa, it was a lot. Yes. Um, Yes. And it was in that where it was kind of like Jaya would suggest, okay, well, now we're going to play with words and phrases, you mm. know, this, and we're, we're going to see what turns you on. And so in the intellectualizing of the words and phrases, we, I, she would say, well, do you think you're into shame, shaming language? And I'd be like, oh, I don't think so. And, you know, part of it's like this, like, oh, I don't want to be. Yeah. And yeah. then she, she, then we'd play with it. And then all of a sudden we'd be like, oh, whoa, that's actually a turn on. Yeah. That actually does turn me on. Yeah. So it was, it was really difficult actually for her when she was doming me yeah. because she couldn't find my edges. So in, in a lot of the things of where she would take an experiment would be very challenging for her because it, I'd be, we'd finish a scene and I'd be like, oh, that was great. And then I'd need to give her aftercare. Because she she had gone through such an experience that it, you know was messing with her emotionally, mm. um, and then when we flipped it and I was doing the dominating of her, then we ran into some of the things of, you know, I would never I would never overtly say that kink work should be used as therapeutic, mm-hmm. but kink can become in the right hands with consent, with safety, yeah. with all yeah. of the things in place yeah. can become very therapeutic. Yeah. And one of the principles of that is that it can give agency. Like let's say you decide to be in the submissive zone yeah. and you've experienced 
trauma or lots of boundary crossing in your yes. past. Yes. If you have somebody who holds that container and puts safety first and, and really honors and can you know be present with whatever's coming up, it puts it can put the agency, even if you're in the submissive role, it can put the agency back in your hands. Yes. And because you're the sub is actually in control of the scene, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You've set out you've set out the scene, you've set out the rules. And therefore, it can give the sub the, fr the freedom to surrender into that space. But we came across some of those edges for Jaya that were really bringing up the trauma. Yes. And we were working with a trauma-informed therapist throughout the whole thing. Yeah. So and that tra they were really helpful with navigating, OK, well, you're trying some of the things with a ball gag or a, you know, a blindfold. You can't, let's take that out of the mix. Jaya needs to have her voice, have her agency throughout the entire thing, needs yeah. to be able to see what's going on. Yeah. yeah. When we, we didn't stop, um, you know, she, she said, if it was somebody else, I would say we stop and we go into this work. But I think the two of you can navigate mm -hmm. this territory mm -hmm. and it might actually take you out to the other side, yeah. but let's remove a few things and let's create more clarity around the boundaries of the scene and all that sort of stuff. So it ended up being very, um, so many layers to that 4040. It was so mm -hmm. rich. Um, mm -hmm. One in terms of finding my own depth of kink. So she brought in kink instructors who could actually take me to those edges. Yes. So we took her out of that mix as well, right? Mm -hmm. So so she didn't have to push herself beyond her edge. Got it. And we we did a lot to make sure we were staying in healthy zones throughout the whole whole place, but. That's just a little bit before that. That's where kink became a full-fledged fifth blueprint. Yep. Wow. Amazing. Um, she hadn't told me, she told me some of, some of that, but not all of that. But the, uh, the essence I got out of it was, oh my God, kink can be sacred, mm. transformative, mm -hmm. a homecoming, yeah. and a, as you, you call it, like a Petri dish or like a fertilized garden. Mm -hmm. through which we pull out the weeds, we mm. allow beauty to arise. And I remember back when I interviewed her, I can't remember, time is hard for me, Ian, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, all these, when all this happened, because I've known her for so long, but I just was like, oh, J Jaya's here. I could sense more of Jaya. Like I have always loved her and been inspired by her, but there was like softness or boldness or these different flavors mm. of her that I hadn't, um, met before and also the feelings and the way that she would describe you mm -hmm. were more enriched and mm -hmm. more nourished and um connected as well i'm like okay they really found something phenomenal there um yeah. by going into that depth and what a gift now to humanity that mm -hmm. uh back with that first story with the gentleman where the energetic really turned him on um mm -hmm. and then all the way to adding the fifth um and i've since because we haven't talked in a long time. I, I've been with a, a partner now since January and there's so much kink that I'm now stepping into wow. with the you know 20 years of doing this work and like, oh, I know this is leading us to God. I know. Um, whereas right. when I first interviewed her back when you guys were talking about this, I'm like, holy shit, good for you too because <laughs> I don't wanna go anywhere near that. And yet, wow, it's, it's beginning. So um, just resource wise, mm. what is the book again that you guys wrote? What was it called again? Cuff, Tied and Satisfied. Oh, this is so good. Cuff, Tied and Satisfied. So we have lots of resources for you on the show. Um, we're going to get you the erotic blueprint um, link so that you can discover who you are. And Ian, would you say I should do it again? This, it changes over time as we evolve, correct? Oh yeah, it can change with the partner with, with you're with. It can change based on your five stages of sexuality, like where you are in healing, resting, adventurous, curious, transformational. Like what are you into at this moment? Yeah. It can change based on biochemistry and age. So there's so many things that can affect where you are on that journey. Yeah. And you know, I mean, especially if you're a shapeshifter or you're, you know, and and one thing that people jump in with is is it's a challenge with all personality typing systems is the kind of thing of like, oh, well, I'm this, I'm a, I'm a sensual. So mm -hmm. now I've got my definition and now I've got some fixed identity. We yeah. don't like to have the blueprints function like that. We like I the agree. blueprints to be an indicator, like a, like your map. Okay. Yeah. This is the territory to explore. If I rank really high as a sensual, I know that I'm going to be really resourced in that 
place of my erotic expression. That's going to be the thing that gives me access to my eroticism and arousal. That's my fastest path. But yeah. it should, and you know, when you do the 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 in depth quiz that we have, you can um, find out your your pleasure profile, which shows you all the percentages of each type that you yes. are. Yes. And knowing your primary is actually shows you where you're limited as much as it shows you where you're resourced because I'm essential, but if I'm cutting off, you know, let's say I'm my second thing on the chart is energetic yeah. and I'm not exploring that or yeah. my partner is a kinky and my third on my chart is kinky. That's a place where you may find some meeting ground. Yeah. You may not want to play in all the same zones, but you can start to find that, that common fertile ground yeah. where there's mutual interests. And, you know, we've got all sorts of awesome tools for that, like a sex communication checklist where you can run down a whole thing of like, I'm into that. I'm into that. I don't even know what that is. I'm, I'm willing to do that. This is a fuck. No, I'm not doing that thing. Yeah. And then yeah. you can take that list and compare it with a lover, a partner, somebody you're dating yeah. and yeah. find those po points where you're like, Oh, we're both really into wanting to do that. Right. You're I'm a, I'll, I'm willing to, and you're a hell yes. So that's a place mm -hmm. where we we're probably need a little right coaching, we might need a little help to yeah. see where my willing to moves into a hell yes. Right. And then there's the, you know, what's really great about something like text communication checklist is you end up um, having your hell nose, right? Like that's one of the things that's so potent and, and kink is an expression of it in, mm. in, in, in its extreme. And, and because the, con the conversations in conscious kink are so clear about boundaries, mm. about what a no is, um, I forget who I'm going to, I wish I could come up with who this was who first introduced me to it. It's this thing of, uh, it's a very powerful phrase of, um, you know, your, your no, your solid no allows yeah. me to trust your yes fully. Oh, yes. So yeah. the no, the hell no starts to define the yes even better yes. and gives you that playground. Kink is a great place to, ex to express and play with that very, very um, consciously and clearly, but every form, every, you know, like two people playing energetically, mm -hmm. you can cross people's energetic boundaries just as easily as you can cross somebody's sexual or kinky or, you know, shapeshifter boundaries. So yeah. really looking into like, what is your body telling you when you're engaging with someone mm -hmm. and listening and then learning, learning how to express, no, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, we need to pause. Mm. I need to stop. I need some space. Yeah, you know, yeah. And doing this in a way that's like nurturing and connecting and not yes. blaming and shaming. And so anyway, all sorts of skill sets and, and, and the dive into the kink world really turned up the volume on making those skill sets explicit. Yeah, stunning. This is yeah. so important for people as they give themselves permission to explore more of their sexuality, to have the communication and the boundaries. And as you said, this sex communication checklist, this is huge, huge mm. for sa for safety and being seen and being authentic. I love yeah. this. Um, so get us back on track with life. You and Jaya, Eamon's growing up. Um, yeah. Next thing I know, you guys are moving to, um, to Denver. And then next thing I know, you're on Netflix. So <laughs> what's happened with the relationship and the, the parenting and the, the company? And, and so tell us more. Oh, my God. Um, so it just all oh, the story just keeps getting more interesting and more intricate and complex <laughs> as we continue to move forward. Um, I jumped in fully around 2014, 2015. I had my design business and it took me a while to sort of weed my way out of that. It was no longer a passion for me. I really wanted, to, I'd been in transformational work since I was in my early 20s and Landmark Forum and Tony Robbins and all of this sure. personal development. Yeah. And I really wanted to be in a zone where I was offering that kind of stuff to the world. Yeah. Didn't know what it was. And I just happened to hook up with Jaya and find sort of the perfect vehicle. Yeah, so the story just keeps getting more complex, more intricate, all sorts of things growing out of this. Um, I had jumped into the business with Jaya officially around 2014, 15. Yeah. That's when the blueprint started to take take hold. Um, I had been in personal development and you know, all that stuff as a side hobby and, and wanted to get into it more deeply. Yeah. Didn't realize that sex and sexuality was going to be the venue. And when I started being more involved in Jaya's work and the whole realm, I realized <clears throat> that 
what a powerful fulcrum it is into someone's life. Yeah. It's like there's two zones that I look at that, it, it, you know, these days where I'm like, uh, these are the two things where you get deep access immediately to how somebody operates in the world. One is money. Yeah. Once you're looking at how somebody uses their money and how they play in the money game, you see the whole prism of how their life operates and sex. Wow. Because sex is relationship, relationship to self, relationship to am I enough and, and relationship to how do I relate and how can I confidently or not confidently express myself with another? How can I get yeah. my needs met? How can I yeah. be honest and forthright about who I am and what I want? Yeah. So sex is a taboo topic in Western culture, especially. Um, so that's another thing kind of appeals to my edginess. I, I, yeah. I don't, I like kind of like being a provocateur. Um, so it appealed on so many levels and I just kept going deeper into it. And when the blueprints came about, it appealed to a whole other level of my entrepreneurship of like, oh, this is a framework. This is something that a, an entire business can be built around yeah. because the root and it's transformational business. It's not like selling a widget. It's like, this is a business that is practical and people can put in their lives and makes yes. the world a better place. Yes. So firing on all cylinders, that's when 2016, we put the quiz together. We put the first version of the course together and launched. Um, and then like I would have gone down that road on its own and just kept building that out and pot, you know, building out some supporting courses and that sort of thing. And Jai yeah. felt like the energy felt really ripe to offer a coaching training. Yeah. There's a few people that asked her about it. And so very quickly after we did our first launch for the blueprint course in January, right at new year's, Jai was like, okay, I'm going to announce this. And she sort of expected maybe five or six people would join in. And she had this little intimate training because she, she'd hit a point as well many times and, and was kind of about to tip over the edge of like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. You know, I'm getting excited about it. And she's like, uh, the resistance, the persecution, the, you know, that this is such a taboo thing. I don't even understand it, but people shut down my website. They, you know, they, you know, emails don't go through and, and, and nobody wants to talk about this topic openly. And honestly, it's all salacious yes. garbage. Yes. So she was worn out and, yes. and, and she's just like, I, I if I'm going to do this, I need help. I need yes. people whom I can train, I can leave a legacy with, and then I can kind of move into other areas that are starting to attract my interest. Mm. So she announced the coach training and within two weeks, we had 50 people signed up. Wow. Yeah. So it was like the easiest, <laughs> easiest promotion we have ever done. Wow. Um, there was no promotion. It was just like a magnet. Boom. Wow. All of a sudden we had a coach training and for the last several years, that's really been ultimately became the focus of the business. Yeah. Um, and we, we've been promoting the blueprints and sharing them, but it hasn't been the main focus. And I think because Jai is moving on to some other zones of where she's putting the focus of her work into philanthropy, um, working on opening up a, a center to cure addiction, working on opening up a center that's uh, around uh, helping sex traffic victims heal using psychedelic therapy and she's yep. done maps training. So there's a whole other thing that's blooming for Jaya in terms of where she really wants to focus her time and energy. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually, cause I've been, I became CEO of the company about a year and a half, two years ago. And um, it was, we were starting to talk about Netflix with Netflix and goop about doing this next, the, the, what became sex, love and goop a spinoff of the, sec the, the Goop Lab. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't locked in or anything like that. But uh, so we kept the coach program going and, and I feel like I'm going tangential. But the, uh, this year I decided to put a temporary, you know, until further notice hold on training any other coaches. Okay. Um, because one, it's like, it, it's a lot to be working in the realm of sexuality and start to have having more than a few hundred people trained and kind of having a sense of like, who are the people in our community? Do we know them really well? Are they really operating within the ethical boundaries and the kinds of and, and things that we've set up? Yeah. So it, it felt like it's a perfect time to get intimate with the coaches we have. Yes. And yes. Really dive in on that front, still supporting them and getting to know who's in this community even more deeply. Yeah. And then the Netflix thing 
became real. We shot it in the spring. We knew it was coming out and COVID messed with everybody's business. We managed to navigate that really well, Mm -hmm. but it was time. It is time. Now's the time to really uh, work on the public facing work, the stuff that's accessible to everyone, which is the erotic movement breakthrough course and the blueprint quiz and our erotic freedom club, which is a zone where people can, you know, be of like-minded seekers in a consensual, safer space to explore and be supported in what can be very edgy growth for a lot of people. Yes. So anyway, there's like, I really adopted taking on more of the development of the, the company yeah. with the idea of giving Jaya more freedom to do what she does, which is, you know, she's the master of this work. She's a somatic sexologist, a body, you know, like um, she's not really going to be working with private clients over the next year, maybe a couple of years, but really moving into working with a lot of mover and mover, shaker, changer people to keep laying the foundation of like, how do we, how do we really move the planet into healing? Yeah. How do we move the planet into open, honest communication? How do we build a wellness model, not a sickness model? Um, and that's around everything. That's our culture. That's our money. That's our, so anyway, there's, there's like, there's a lot of really big stuff at play in terms of conversations mm-hmm. we're having and what we're, we're up to on that front mm-hmm. and the blueprint work for me and this community and erotic freedom club is, is a place for freedom of expression, conscientious, consensual freedom of expression, where we can build a different we can build a different ship, right? Mm. We've been on this ship for 10,000 years, cultural shame, putting sex in a box where the communication is not open, where people don't have a language, where people are siloed, hiding out from themselves, hiding out from their partners. And instead of fighting the system, trying to you know, make big change, on, we, we wanna do that too, but let's make our own planet our own pleasure island, right? Mm. Like, how are we doing it over here? And let the gravitational pull of that become so strong that it then it just kind of starts to roll out into society. And that's where the Sex, Love, and Goop program is one of these fulcrum moments. Yeah. That show went out last Thursday to 208 subscribing households, 190 countries, and 32 languages. So... And, and it's not just Jaya's work, but there's several other healers in that program whose work is focused yeah. on. And the, it, they did a, the, the producers, Natalie, um, I'm forgetting Natalie's last name, but Natalie and Shauna, the producers and directors of that were so amazing to mm. work with. Mm. They let all of the practitioners do their work and they, yeah. doc, you know, they, they, docu- they were documentary filmmakers you know, they would ask inciting questions and, and we would work with them to, to make sure we're getting the deep, the, the deepest aspects of the work. Yeah. And then it's, you know, it's amazing, of course, when you watch a TV show that's been edited down from three days of work into, you know, yes. Jaya collectively in the show is probably an hour or something over the six episodes. But there's so much that went on that was magic that they didn't even capture, yes. but they did such a good job of consolidating mm-hmm. the the growth, the breakthroughs, the openings. Um, and there's a, there's, there's a thought burbling in here, but it, you know, it's something about the show has an energy of a reversal of the patriarchal approach to pleasure. Mm. And not just how it's affected vulva bodied humans on the planet, but how it does a disservice to all the cock bodied or inter, you know, um, all the you know, genitals in between, like everybody has suffered yes. from the imposition of shame around sex. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And the show gently in most places and very forthrightly really shows how much pain people are holding in their bodies. Yeah. Around that aspect of how we treat ourselves and our pleasure. Mm. Wow, you're moved right now, Ian. Tell me more. <laughs> it's this is the reason for the work. Yeah. 
there's so much um, gripping and fear and so much on the flip side of that, so much of people um, reaching out to grab and take, you know, gets manifest in rape and abuse and boundary crossing. Yeah. And we have generational trauma that just keeps getting reinforced over and over again. And until we break the cycle yeah. and start to have this open, honest dialogue yeah. about where we've come from, why it is that we've been in this conversation of shaming our bodies and shaming each other. Yeah. Once we start to dismantle that, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to, to end trauma, end shame, end yeah. uh, the generational loops that have kept us buried. And of course, there's just massive work to do on that front. Like, you know, from, from cultural beliefs, family beliefs, religious beliefs that are kind of holding us in these patterns, yeah. but a show, the willingness, the courage, the courage of Gwyneth Paltrow and Elise from her team to take on this topic yeah. and put it in a, put it on a show for, with such vulnerability to be seen by so many people yes. and that Netflix is taking it on. I'm just like, I'm honored to be part of the pro project. I'm, I'm grateful that somebody has taken Jaya's work and the other experts work in the, in the show and really shown people what's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being the embodiment of this and moving forward. Mm. I have like two or three directions I want, I want to head, but I want to stay focused on this thread. What's happened to you and Jaya as, as a couple you, you, you've gone through your own um, integration of your traumas. You've spoken up more, listening to yourself and to one another. You, you are navigating companies and, and deep transformation. It sounds like she's going more into philanthropy, as you, as you were saying. First off, how are you two different? at this moment, right here, right now, based on how far you've come? How are you two different? There's a whole other through line in the story of our relationship. Yeah. Um, just wondering how I can sort of consolidate what that story is. We had the rocky period I told you about after our son's birth and, and yeah. navigated that um, through the blueprint work and all of that sort of thing. We had another rocky period from 2017 and 18 yeah. where um, all of the things that Jaya had, she's spoken publicly about this. So I'm, I don't think I'm sharing anything that's not out there. Um, well, I know I'm not, but um, so basically I have consent to share to a certain degree on, on, on this story. Yeah. Um, we, had some extenuating circumstances that started to exacerbate Jaya's trauma. Yes. And all of the techniques and the tools and the things that she had done, somatic experiencing, EMDR, meditation practices, all sorts of ways of managing it were just managing. Yes. And there were some outside influences at that time in our life that were really turning up the heat. Yeah. Um, and the trauma started to get deeper and deeper and the management of it became less and less effective. Yes. And she had gotten a diagnosis from the, no, she did the brain scan at the Amen clinics and, and I had done the same and, and her brain showed that she had a highly traumatized brain and they gave her a, um, um, CPTSD, diagnosis so ptsd post-traumatic stress disorder but this was chronic uh, is it chronic I, I don't know chronic i feel like i'm getting that part wrong but it's basically a much higher level like somebody who's experienced been in, in the soup of a traumatic environment yeah. and it's so ingrained and they they talk about it as being um basically unfixable or uncurable mm. and she ran into someone at a gathering that we were at who said, well, I was diagnosed with CPTSD and I, I cured it. 
And she was like, what are you talking about? She said, hey, I'm, I'm no longer a qual and then no longer qualify as that diagnosis. Yeah. And I did it through MDMA therapy. Yeah. And Jaya was very anti-drugs, thought that whole thing was, you know, like clean purist, no drugs, no, you know, hadn't had a drop of alcohol in her life, all that sort of thing. So it was extremely edgy for her, yes. but also getting to the point of desperation. Yes. And we, at the end of the summer of 2018, um, without going into all the details, ended up with like, it was, you know, the, the attachment styles, if we're looking at this through the attachment styles, Jaya had become highly avoidant. I had become highly anxious and the, all those things were turning into a very intense soup of, of disconnection. Yeah. We ended up breaking up at the mm. end of 2018. Um, you know, nobody knew it because we were kind of like just in the throes of kind of about to start dealing with this. Yeah. And we had already scheduled some sessions to do some of this, you know, very controversial therapy. It doesn't fix everything for everybody. Yeah. Um, and she went into a session and the very first session was a miracle mm -hmm. um, for her. There were several stages where it moved into a, a whole other um, level of what that work offered. Yeah. But just the first session, essentially, I like talk about it as it took the, the removed the scales from her eyes. Yeah. She saw what our relationship was like, you know, in my anxiousness, I was like, what are you doing? Well, how is this happening? Like, how, are, what, well, how yeah. is this? And it, it was her trauma leading the conversation and my yeah. response to that trauma that was making this soup. Um, but what we realized was at the core at that point of our relationship really was unconditional love. Like yeah. we just love each other deeply. Yeah. And all of the stories or the impact of the stories or the grip of those stories that had been created over the couple of years leading up to that situation all fell away. Mm -hmm. And we were able to essentially immediately reconnect yeah. in that environment. And then over the next several months, she had a, um, I'm so bad with words, sorry for this, but there's, no, there's very doing... specific phrases that, um, can be used around this that, that I'm not getting quite right, but it's basically a, yeah, full, a full mystical experience. Yeah. Where she had a unity experience. Yes. And several months later, I had my own version of that. Mm -hmm. And we already sort of blew the things up and got back into love with each other. But once that kicked in, we've had a very different experience, not just within our own relationship, but with how we navigate life day yes. to day, yes. all the things that would normally be, you know, would have normally been much bigger triggers or much, you know, created loops and stories and, and kind of exacerbated stuff. There's a easier ability to get to a place of remembering yeah. who and what we are yeah. and letting go of the forgetting. We still forget. <laughs> we still get caught up in the stuff because sure. life is life and it's designed to do that. Mm. But we both in the last three years have a much easier, deeper access to yeah. letting go of all the stories and being in what is, whether that isness is highly stressful, tons going on, or sitting in our backyard in our hot tub, you know, staring at the birds. Yeah. The last time I spoke with her was after, I don't know where along the journey it was, but it was after the first miracle experience oh, and that is right. the um she was trying to ground it and then you mentioned satyan and that work and that was that was very fundamental for her navigating and being able to actually ground what had taken her into that very ethereal yes. out there like yes. how do i bring this because she was going into a place of like i don't want to be in my body i don't want to be in the earth anymore yes yes so thank you for that that was oh. it was great to reconnect with satyan and and have that rooting and worked with him extensively extensively over the last several years yes you have and i'm so grateful i'm so grateful ian for the universe like look how my dance with you and her over all the years and then that conversation and it was so ripe and raw when we had it um and just to know that was who to mention and then mm. just you know all of the unfolding it's just it's uh 
it's breathtaking really yeah that yep. you if you just keep showing up mm -hmm. you'll get the pieces that you have to choose right but, but um i'm so so pleased to hear all this well, i had I an do... experience just a couple of days ago where there's there's just these people who kind of continue coming in to life like they'll just they'll show up again. Like, you know, I, I have this with individual people. I have this weird thing that this happens with celebrities. Like they just kind of keep showing up in different facets and I'm a different role, but they're, they come yeah. in and I relate to me totally differently. Yeah. Um, but it's kind it's, it's, just, it's the cosmic game thing of like, we're, are we all connected in some fantastic odd game Yes. where the players continue showing up over and over again. There can be years of gaps in between. Yes. yes. But they pop up and they're like, oh, and they drop in this little bit of wisdom or they give this nudge to go in this direction. Yes. And so I, I had a very explicit experience with this when we were in LA recently. I was like, oh, wow. Every, all these characters, you know, continue to show up in my life mm. in the most odd and miraculous of ways. So yeah, mm. I totally relate with what you're talking about yeah so it's so so rich to hear your side of the the of sharing of this beautiful journey um mm -hmm. and such gratitude that i i love you guys and i'm so glad i could just even place a stone in the pond that's rippled <laughs> uh rippled out with sachan and the work and your coaching and and everything and i want to also really thank you both for being such leaders in in the world and in the media and in philanthropy and uh, and with Netflix and the show, it makes what I'm doing easier. It makes mm. it's like a um, an ice cutter ship. Sure, I believe like I'm an ice cutter ship in my world, but you are most definitely an ice cutter ship in yours, and it makes it easier for me to do what I'm doing. And I'm inspired to follow up this conversation. We could probably have a three hour podcast at this point, but <laughs> I know we need to cut it cut it short soon. But with my uh, partnering app with with Heartmates creating a place where people will, conscious people will date who are doing the work and practicing mm -hmm. communication. And when I first started it, it was very much what I'd learned from Sachin over the last few years and all the work that I've done around heart. And yet the sexuality piece, now that my son is 18 and I'm not going to be dragged to court anymore of what I right. do, right? Yeah. I have more freedom. And now that I'm in a relationship, I feel more permission to be more sexual awesome. um, because I have it's not like I'm, is she coming onto you too? Like I did, uh -huh. there's just some sort of, I, I can be brighter um, in it. So I know that there's uh, how can we, with your blueprint and what you provide and co-aligning co curriculums mm -hmm. to support people as, as they date. So I want to, I want to follow up after we do our podcast on. Great. Are um, you paired with Adam? Got Adam, Adam Galad? Oh yeah. Is that the, you on that project? No, his, his, oh. his is a different app. His is kinder. Mine okay. is called Heart Heartmates. Heartmates. So mine actually has a dating um, component to the curriculum. So there's the mm. curriculum. There's the live conscious connection calls where we do dyads, um, and then there's the date, the dating. It's all within one. Yeah. Um, so his is more community, but not actually officially dating within it. Got it. But yeah, but Adam's a great, uh, you know, colleague and a affiliate and brother. Awesome. It was, yeah. it was Adam, Adam's hot tub. It was Adam's hot tub. <laughs> exactly. Like another yeah. full circle, right? Yeah, another full circle. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And now he's going to be a father again. Yeah. Um, right. Wow. <laughs> I know. Right. All these years. So lots of good, lots of good family. We're all mm -hmm. the same, you know, tribe family. Um, so I want people to know about the Netflix special. I want people will have the link in the show notes to get your erotic blueprint. Even if you've uh, watched a podcast, all the way back when it first came out and you're watching this again with Ian right now, you know, take the test again or take the quiz again. Mm. Um, and then it sounds like there's different programs and community, et cetera. Um, I know you're not working with private people, uh, private clients, maybe for a while. Um, do you still do workshops for couples? Is there any other thing you want to share with us that you two are up to right now? The, because COVID sort of scrambled the deck in terms yeah. of live workshops, yeah, we went virtual. I know that I don't, we don't have them on schedule yet, but there will be some virtual um, stuff coming up in 2022. May get into live workshops again. It's sort of, I'm, I'm not setting anything on the calendar quite yet outside sure. of stuff that we already have to deliver. Yeah. Um, and because it just, you know, it just gets 
the, the, it just gets turned over. They're like, I make a plan and then poof, I know, I know. <laughs> it's just totally smashed. So um, I'm hoping that we can get something in books towards the end of 2022 or beginning 2023 for a larger live event because we were starting to get into the, you know, 800 people attending kind of thing. Yeah, it was smashed. phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the, but what's great about the global reach and having pivoted to Zoom and, and other formats is we can, you know, the hours are terrible for people in Europe and Australia, but we at least, they can at least get here without the plane flights and the, they can, or they can participate without the plane flights and the hotel yeah. rooms and all that stuff. Yeah. So there will be some of that coming up. Yes. Um, and, and it's going to be an interesting thing because the Netflix show has created an international, truly international. We were already international, but now it's, there's just so much more awareness that's going to be in place over the next few months around mm our work. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. We have our 220, you know, working coaches trained yeah. 330 of them. Um, our coaches are immersed in our erotic freedom club. So they're in the mix. They'll be part of the workshops. Cause that's, that was part of the transition for Jaya is like not to be the face. We'd never wanted to be the face of the company. We didn't want to build a brand that was a guru brand or like a mm. personality driven brand. Mm. It's a framework brand. Yeah. You know, every, every coach has a different approach because it's their personal view, their personal take on yeah. how the blueprints affect their life and, mm -hmm. and how they can incorporate it working with clients. Mm -hmm. So our focus over the next several months to a couple of years is to deepen that foundation yeah. that this is a methodology. It's not a person. Yeah. You know, it's not a, it's not an individual healer. And, and in fact, there's nothing to heal. There's nothing broken yeah. with any individual. Yeah. It's simply the remembering, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. Shed the story, remember who you are and have the confidence that it's okay. You're safe, you're whole, you're complete. Yeah. yeah. So that's where, that's where the work is headed and there will be, you know, um, workshops and all that awesome, awesome stuff. Mm, mm, I love it, I love yeah. it. So um, my last question's in completion here. So. What has the full self-expression of your sacred sexuality um, provided for you? What are you so grateful for about your unique expression? Hmm. A occurrence that happens over and over again is when I step out into some authentic reveal of some part uh, that was hidden, buried, shamed, or it doesn't even have, it can simply be like, this is the way that I'm choosing to express in this environment. Inevitably, there are the people who reflect to me at some point or other you're speaking about that, you're doing that, you're expressing of that, open the door for my own freedom of expression. Like an example was at one of the past passions I have, we do erotic persona work. There's so many things that are just amazing and fun about the work that we do. It's not, it's not the, you know, sex can be very serious business, but it shouldn't, certainly shouldn't be most of the time. It should be very <laughs> fun and playful. Mm -hmm. So we have this empowered erotic persona work where we, where it's not like you're pretending to be characters, you're actually adopting aspects of your eroticism that may be mm -hmm. buried, shamed, hidden and integrating them. So, yes. and, but these personas come out of them. And I have this one um, who is called Marcus Aurelius. He is not the, you know, the stoic, um, but there's another Marcus Aurelius who, he, which I found out about later, who's much more tied to, who was very Dionysian and a provocateur and whatnot. So I didn't even know that guy existed and, he, and, and I've named this character Marcus Aurelius. And he is a, he is a, a mix of the masculine and feminine, uh -huh. always masculine on the top and always feminine on the bottom. And these are stereotypical versions of feminine, but like, you know, like we'll wear leggings and a skirt and, you know, um, platform boots yeah. uh, on the bottom and have this very masculine thing. So I'll bring this character out to lead the Iraq persona parade at our path to passion event. And 
the first year I did that, I also talked some stories about revealing of like, these are aspects of my personality and I haven't brought them out and here they are. And that night, one very specific thing was a gentleman had a conversation with his wife that evening saying, revealing to her that he had been cross-dressing in secret for years mm. and very vulnerable. Yes. She had the capacity to see him, not shame him. Yes. And the following day on Sunday at the last day of the event, he uh, came down wearing a skirt and leggings and high heel shoes with his wife in full acceptance of each other. Mm. And this incredible freedom for this man who'd been hiding out about yes. this aspect for decades. Yes. So it's that kind of thing that my own journey of expression and expansion and giving myself permission gives permission to others. Totally. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And bless you, amazing man. Thank, Thank you, you so much for this conversation. Give my yeah. love to Jaya. I shall. And, and anything you ever need, we're here to support you. We're blessed. Thank you. To and be vice versa. Community. We should not, uh, we should not um, go so long without communicating. Yeah, I'll be in touch sooner than later. Absolutely. Okay, cool. Huge love to you. Mwah. Huge love. Mwah. Okay.